Ahoy hoy, I'm Planner Walk, and today we're going to take a look at a video from a group called Quantum Gravity Research. Now on the surface of it, this group does appear to be quite legitimate. However, they do step heavily into woo territory. Many of their claims are strikingly similar to the sorts of claims that you'd hear on spirit science. Now because they are far more professional than any other person that I've looked at on this channel, I did decide to get the help of a scientist. Now the scientist in question is Dr. Clive Wells, and I'll make sure to link to his channel, it'll probably be up there, because he did help me out a lot with making this. There are certain things that I just wouldn't have thought to include in this video if it wasn't for him, so make sure you go check him out. And it's also his birthday today, so happy birthday Clive! Now this is the part where I'd normally say, let's get into the video, but this video is a half hour long video with top tier production quality, so I'm actually going to summarise certain parts. Because even though it does try to pass off woo as science, it has some somewhat informative parts, especially near the beginning. So the video starts by talking about crystals, and no, they don't actually take the normal woo route where they say, oh, they can heal you or whatever. They actually explain what a crystal is. They explain that a crystal is a periodic repeating pattern. So you can have 2D crystals and you can have 3D crystals. They then go on to say that you can project a three-dimensional crystal down to two dimensions. And in the example that they give, the projection is not periodic, so they call that a quasi-crystal. After explaining that, they then go on to explain the main thesis of the video. A group of physicists in Los Angeles is working on a new physics theory where a particular 8D crystal, yep, that's right, an eight-dimensional crystal, is projected to 4D at a very particular angle, which forms a 4D quasi-crystal. And from this 4D quasi-crystal, they derive a 3D quasi-crystal, which they believe is the fundamental substructure of all of reality. Now if this were the only claim in the video, then I wouldn't be making a video on this because that kind of thing is very similar to string theory and may actually be a possibility of how the universe works. Now there are problems with string theory, the main one of course being at this point it cannot be tested. But at least it doesn't try to package up woo and sell it to you, at least not from what I can tell. So the video then goes on to state that the 3D quasi-crystal throughout all of reality is a tetrahedron, and that the size of the tetrahedron is a Planck length, which is the smallest size in the universe. And they say that these tetrahedrons can be in one of a few possible states. Now all that is fine, but then they go on to say this. If a certain tetrahedron can be in any one of just a few possible states in a given moment, who or what chooses the state it should be in at any given moment. Well, for such a choice to be made, we need to scientifically, mathematically, and logically bring in a new element into physics. And that element is consciousness. Now, that kind of statement was certainly enough to set alarm bells off in my head. When you're talking about the fundamental aspects of the universe and then you bring up consciousness, then you're probably not going to be having a very scientific discussion about it. If you're not a scientist, you might be surprised to learn that nobody actually knows the exact value of the speed of light. We have a close approximation, but not the exact value. The closest we can get to measuring it has to do with the precision of our machines. But no matter how precise our machines get, we will never be able to measure the exact speed of light without a theory that tells us what it is and why it is. And none of the current physics theories do that. So the exact speed of light, and I'm not making this up, but the exact speed of light is 299,792,000. 458 meters per second exactly. Now the reason why this is the case is because the meter is literally defined by the speed of light. So if we find that the speed of light is actually slightly different than what we thought, then the length of the meter has to change because the meter is defined by the speed of light. Now obviously we all know the size of a meter. It's about twice that long. Now obviously a tape measure isn't the most accurate thing in the world, but a tape measure does have a pretty good approximation of a meter. But the thing is, there are far more accurate measurements of a meter out there. So we have a pretty good idea of the speed of light. Now there will always be at least some amount of error, there's no getting around that, but I don't think it's as significant as she's making it out to be. And I don't think a theory of everything is going to solve the error, because a theory of everything would have to be based off the measurements we have taken. And so therefore, if measurements we've taken at least have a small amount of error, then the theory of everything will at least have a small amount of error. 
Our best physics theories, Einstein's theory of relativity, and quantum mechanics both use the speed of light as a starting point. In other words, they use an inexact measurement of the speed of light without explaining why it is, what it is, or why the universe even has a speed limit in the first place. We need a new theory. So it is actually quite well understood, at least to an extent. You've got things like Maxwell's equations, which you can pair with Einstein's relativity. When you pair them together, you find that there is a speed limit in all reference frames. Now obviously not all questions are answered, but that's part of the beauty of science. It keeps on trying to find answers for these questions. Basically what is needed is a theory of everything. A theory that explains the very fundamental aspects of reality. String theory, which once held a lot of promise for possibly being a successful theory of everything, has not made any successful predictions. And regardless of predictions, the theory itself isn't actually a theory of everything. It's just not, because it can't explain the speed of light or the other constants. But the thing is though, the hypothesis that they are proposing is actually very similar to string theory. In fact, it pretty much takes something directly from string theory. But that's for later on in the video. Also, I do get quite skeptical when someone says, why is this value this particular value? Sometimes there will be an underlying answer, but sometimes it just so happens that that's the value that it happened to be. The video then goes on to state that there are seven clues as to what a theory of everything might look like. A growing number of physicists are saying reality is made of information. What does that even mean? Well, information is meaning in the form of symbolism. A language or code provide this kind of information conveying symbolism. A very different type of symbol is one that represents itself. Geometric symbols can do that. A cube can represent love, if we say it does, or it can represent, really with minimal subjectivity, itself. Could there be a language or code made out of geometry? So information is not inherently a language. Take for example this random set of numbers that I'll come up with on the spot. One, five, eight, seven, seven, three, two, eight, six, four, nine, three, zero, four, four, eight, two, nine, three, pi, four, nine. That is information, but there's no language there. Likewise, the information in a particle doesn't have any language or code in it. It's just the information about that particle. At best, you can say that language or code can describe it. But that doesn't mean that language or code is inherent to it. Reality is geometric. A geometric language in the form of geometric symbolism, the type of symbols that represent themselves, might explain how a geometric reality can be made of pure information. Or maybe it's that information is really good at describing things in the universe, so much so that we could pretty much say that the universe is made out of information. Information implies meaning. But what is meaning? Meaning is a comparison. That's what we do. But we do it so fast we don't realize we're doing it. We, we look at something and we match it to something from our database. We say, that is a crosswalk. That is a building, not a crosswalk. That is a window, not a building. So meaning is the perception of something relative to something else. So therefore meaning is subjective and requires choice. So if you use the definition of meaning being a comparison between two things, then meaning exists without subjectivity. Two atoms exist relative to one another, whether you are looking at them or not. That does not require subjectivity. But if you want to say that meaning has something to do with subjectivity, then information does not imply meaning in that case, because information is not subjective. Or at least when we're talking about information in physics, it's not. Now the next thing that they state is that Einstein says that all time exists all the time. And the only thing I can really say about that is that it's a little bit of issue with the phrasing there. It'd be more accurate to say something like all time exists and we perceive ourselves to be moving through it. They compare it to frames in a movie and then go on to say this. See how all frames exist in Einstein's space time all at once? Okay, now here's where things get really, really weird. We assume that the past influences the future. That's how we appear to experience reality. But when you look at this block, why would one side be the past and one side be the future? Why go left to right and not right to left? Why can't the future influence the past? I take away the names past and future if that helps you think of this concept. So what if the past influences the future and the future influences the past in an endless feedback loop? So then the question is which part of the past is influencing which part of the future and vice versa? And the answer is all time is affecting all time, all the time. So this is an interesting question. Why is the arrow of time the way that we experience it? Why isn't the arrow of time pointing a different direction? Why not the other way? The answer, of course, comes down to the second law of thermodynamics, or thermal dynamics if you're JM Truth, which says that entropy tends to increase over time. And because of this increase in entropy, well, that is the arrow of time. Now it is often interesting to think that the future could impact the present, but without good evidence, there's no reason to think that it does. So if every moment is co-creating every other moment, both forward and backward in time, 
then reality would be this massive neural network spanning space and time. So firstly, a neural network is not just simply one thing affecting another. A neural network is a way of processing information, like our brains do. So you have neurons, and in the case of computers, you have virtual neurons, and these neurons will process a bit of information and then send it on to the next neuron layer. This is not something that can be applied to anything. For example, your computer is probably not running a neural network unless you're doing something with AI. So even if we accept that time affects all other time, it doesn't follow from that that reality would be a neural network. It just doesn't follow. But the fact that all time exists all the time does not mean that the future is written in stone and we're some kind of programmed animation or something. It kind of does though, because for the future to affect you, the future has to happen in the way that it happens. Because if the future doesn't happen in the way that it happens, then how can it affect you? The only way to possibly get around this is to have a multiverse and have a future from another universe affect you. And then only then may the future have some leeway. That's what they used to believe though. Years ago, it was popular to believe in the somewhat bummer idea of reality being a deterministic program playing itself out. Why did scattered by electrons and bounce off electrons? The famous double slit experiment ruled out determinism. Look it up if you've never heard of it. It's wild and is one of the cornerstones of modern physics. But for now, take my word for it. It ruled out determinism and ushered in a new era of non-determinism, or basically free will. So I'm not going to take your word for it because I don't think that the double slit experiment rules out determinism. So let's start with the double slit experiment and why it does not rule out determinism. Now essentially in the double slit experiment you have two slits and you fire something like light through it and the detector behind these two slits should register an interference pattern because light is a wave. Now when you introduce an observation and forget what Orphan Red said, you do not need consciousness to make this observation, it is just an interaction really. But when you make this observation it turns out that, oh, I guess light's a particle now. And because it's a particle now it only went through one of the slits and you get a pattern on the detector that is just two lines. Now I don't think that this rules out determinism because there could be other variables there that we just simply do not know about. And there's nothing there to say that in that experiment what exactly happens wasn't always going to happen from the beginning of the universe. And obviously if all time just exists then everything has technically already happened so the results are already there and therefore determined. Another thing that I have to point out is that Non-determinism does not mean free will. Now the reason why I say this is, well, as Scotty says, you cannot change the laws of physics. So free will is constrained by physics because firstly, you can't do whatever you want to do, otherwise I'd be able to fly like Superman. And even if we ignore that, the physics of the brain essentially make it a computer. And because it's a computer, you can't just simply choose how it processes information. Think about it like this, most of the times you cannot choose your emotions. Yeah, sometimes you can think about things that make you happy or sometimes you can think about things that make you sad, but most of the times you don't get to choose those emotions. And I don't think I ever choose to think about things that make me sad because I'd rather not be sad, to be honest. So, how does free will work? One of the most surprising discoveries of quantum physics is that reality only exists when it is observed. That literally, particles do not exist until they are observed. Famous physicist John Wheeler, he's the guy who came up with the term black hole, says that reality is made of information, which is created by observation. The observation must be made, he says, by something conscious. And Nobel Prize winner Frank Wilczek said that quantum theory is contentious and obscure, and that it will remain that way until someone constructs, within the formalism of quantum mechanics, an observer, a model entity whose states correspond to a recognizable caricature of conscious awareness. So when it comes to the whole conscious observer thing in quantum mechanics, that used to be an idea, but has since been discarded. So an observation is really just an interaction. You don't have to have a conscious observer there. So when a wave function collapses, that is an interaction. Although Clive explained to me that wave function collapsing is better explained through decoherence. The only people that try to hinge quantum mechanics on consciousness are pseudoscientists like Deepak Chopra. Consciousness relates deeply to physics in ways not yet fully understood. In fact, consciousness is kind of like one of the least understood things in all of science. Nobody knows exactly what it is. Well, we do have a pretty good idea of what it is. We do know that neurons process information, and we know that certain chemicals like serotonin and dopamine are responsible for certain emotions. We also know where things are processed in the brain, like language, and to an extent we also know how they are processed. Obviously consciousness is quite complex, so we don't understand every single facet about it. 
but we do understand a decent portion of it. Machine learning is pretty much based on our understanding of human consciousness. German physicist Werner Heisenberg developed the first equations of quantum mechanics using a type of math called matrix theory. He deduced that space and time were pixelated into indivisible three-dimensional Planck length units, just like the two-dimensional pixels on your computer screen. It's good to be native pixels. The mathematics indicated this. And interestingly, there was no solid experimental evidence for smooth, in other words, not pixelated space-time. Well, there's no experimental evidence either way. It could be smooth, or it could be pixelated. And at this current point in time, we do not have the technology to be able to tell because the things that we are talking about are very tiny. So I think it would be better to say we don't actually know. 80 years of smashing particles together in particle accelerators, such as the famous Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, have given us a strange clue that all the fundamental particles and forces convert into one another. Like they literally transform from one to the other according to a process called gauge symmetry transformation. And all of these conversions correspond to a shape. And not just any shape, an eight-dimensional shape. Now this shape forms a crystal. Now remember, crystals are periodic patterns of a certain shape. Like that checkerboard is a 2D crystal made up of squares. So this crystal is of a particular eight-dimensional shape. And this crystal is known as the E8 lattice. So the interesting thing here is that the E8 lattice came from string theory. So it is funny how at the beginning they said, oh, string theory doesn't work. Yet one of the ideas that they got is ripped directly from string theory. But obviously string theory sometimes even goes up to 16 dimensions and they're just trying to stick with eight. So I guess it's slightly different. So the next thing that they do is they go ahead and relate the E8 lattice with the golden ratio. There's a few more steps to that, but it's not important. The important thing is that they're talking about the golden ratio. They also mention how the golden ratio shows up a lot. Now the golden ratio does seem to be the go-to number for woo peddlers because, I mean, it's called the golden ratio. But the next thing that they bring up is matrix maths and they're going to link it back to the golden ratio. So don't worry, we haven't skipped too much. Matrix math is the type of math that quantum physics uses in its formulas. Without getting too technical, this is an example of a matrix. A matrix is just a group of numbers that are arranged in columns and rows. And there's a certain amount of combinations for these numbers inside the matrix. Like if a matrix has four numbers inside it, there are 24 different possible combinations for those four numbers. So the big issue here is that matrices can't just simply be rearranged. If you have a matrix, those numbers that are in it aren't just random numbers. So you can't go ahead and go, oh, I want to put this number here instead of here, because that's not how a matrix works. Quantum mechanics uses matrices that are binary, so they only contain various combinations of two numbers. Each of these combinations of numbers has a value. It's called an eigenvalue. Some eigenvalues are called trivial. These are values like one, two, and zero. So this is a bit of a nitpick, and I mean, I get things wrong all the time when it comes to pronunciation, but it's eigenvalue, not eigenvalue. But apart from that, there is the issue of if an eigenvalue is trivial, that just simply means that it's zero or null. And some are called non-trivial, and those are all sorts of more complex looking numbers. So here's the interesting part. Was that interesting part? Oh yes, here. The highest probability non-trivial eigenvalues that show up in binary matrices are, ready for this, the golden ratio and minus one over the golden ratio. So we now see a deep link between black holes and quantum mechanics because the golden ratio appears deeply in both black hole physics and in quantum mechanics. That literally doesn't mean anything. Just because something shows up in two different things doesn't mean that those two different things are related. There is the obvious thing of, you know, if your grandma is 69, well, guess what that's related to? I mean, it's clearly relating to 1953, obviously. What were you thinking of? Well, my point here is that you can choose any number and say that two things are related because of this number. I mean, it's literally what conspiracy theorists do. The golden ratio appears to startling accuracies in many other ways throughout the universe in scales both large and small. It is so prevalent that its existence simply cannot be looked at as coincidental. In the past, the appearance of this ratio has usually been ignored by scientists because they had no way to explain it. So interest in it was considered the stuff of amateur scientists. But now, for the first time, a rigorous quantum gravity theory is being developed, which predicts the golden ratio's existence, literally, everywhere. Yeah, but other numbers show up everywhere too, like pi. In fact, I think that pi should be called the golden ratio rather than phi. Especially seeing as I would want to know what quacks would do if we just called pi the golden ratio instead of phi. Would they start adopting pi as some holy number? Especially seeing as pi is a ratio itself, it's the ratio between the diameter of a circle and its circumference. But anyway, to address the point that she was making about phi showing up everywhere, yeah, Sometimes numbers just show up coincidentally. Pi shows up in some pretty unexpected places as well. And sometimes it's just a simple factor of things coming together in order to produce that result. Like phi showing up a lot could actually be related to the fact that it is related to the Fibonacci sequence. 
So we think reality is a mosaic-like code or language at the smallest scale of reality possible, which is called the Planck length. Particle accelerator data tells us that all particles and forces relate to one another according to a higher dimensional crystal called the E8 lattice. Well, it doesn't actually tell us that. That is just an interpretation that you have. But reality appears to be 3D. So we project a slice of this E8 crystal down to 3D, which produces a quasi-crystal code or language. And that allows these geometric symbols to build up to the ordinary world of particles and forces that we see around us. Now, this geometric language has rules, but it also has syntactical freedom like any language. And that requires some notion of a chooser to choose the free steps in the language. So even if we grant, oh, this is a code, just because a code exists doesn't mean that there has to be a choose there. I mean, DNA can be seen as a type of code. That doesn't require any chooser or any intelligent being. It's just simply a result of natural processes. A universal collective consciousness is one answer, but that sounds new age and religious. I mean, yeah, it does. And it is something that would be highly complex. And if you want to explain the universe with something that is way too complex, you have quite a bit of explaining to do. Now, nowadays, a good number of physicists discuss the idea that our whole universe is actually a code-based simulation in some fantastically powerful quantum computer in another universe. Now, if true, then by the same logic, that other universe, where the computer running the simulation of our universe is, would also supposedly be a simulation in another universe. So the idea is a little shaky, but it's being discussed seriously by a lot of credible people. It's being discussed, but at the end of the day, if the universe were to actually be a simulation, we wouldn't be able to know about it. The reason being is because we wouldn't have access to anything outside the simulation. It's kind of pointless to discuss something that we can never actually know about. But it turns out that a universal collective light consciousness of some sort may be physically inevitable. Now, we don't need to anthropomorphize this idea or make it religious or spiritual. To follow why, let us start with the idea of the collective behavior of cells in your body, each a single-celled microbe living its life. A long time ago, only this sort of cellular life form existed here on Earth. These little guys were not too smart, but they did choose what direction to swim and could chase nutrients, reproduce, and run from dangerous things. They made choices with their very simple systems of environmental awareness and desire to survive. Except I wouldn't really use the word choose here, because when you use the word choose, it makes it kind of sound like it's a conscious decision. Decision. But what it actually is, is it's environmental processes reacting to the environment. Much in the same way that your computer will react to input. Your computer doesn't really decide anything, it just reacts to what you do. Your computer didn't choose to show you the blue screen of death, that's just a result of its programming and probably some kind of error. Physics allows the possibility of all the energy in the universe to eventually convert into a single conscious system that is itself a network of other conscious systems a massive, technologically-based collective consciousness. Given enough time, anything that can happen will eventually happen. By this axiom, the system of universal consciousness has already merged somewhere in the frames of space-time ahead of us. Because it is possible, it is inevitable. In fact, according to the evidence of retrocausality time loops, that inevitable future is co-creating us right now, just as we are co-creating it. All right, so there's quite a few things to go over there. So the first is, just because something can happen doesn't mean that it will happen. For every single possible thing to happen, you need an infinite amount of time. Now technically, there will be an infinite amount of time, but there won't be an infinite amount of time before the heat death of the universe. So that does seem like something that is inevitable at this point. So that will reduce the amount of different things that can happen. Next, we have to consider this universal consciousness and compare it to the consciousness that has emerged through evolution. Consciousness through evolution emerged because of environmental pressures. However, with a universal consciousness, there is no environmental pressure there. Now obviously this doesn't exclude some kind of universal consciousness from arising, but it does make it incredibly unlikely. But yeah, that was the video from Quantum Gravity Research. High production quality, but not necessarily sound science. But once again, I do want to thank Dr. Clive Wells for helping me with this video because if it wasn't for his help, some of the things I would just wouldn't have been able to point out. So make sure you leave a like and subscribe to Dr. Clive Wells. Subscribe to me if you haven't already and ring the bell notification icon so that you get notified of when I post new videos. As always, a big shout out to my $20 or more patrons. Hugh Jars, MC Nutkin, Shaky, Wolfie, Mori, Ghost, Kid Vicious, Sarcha Campbell and Militant Agnostic. If you want to support me financially, you can do so on Patreon. There should be a link there. But anyway, I will see you in the next video. Between you and me, thank you for watching.